May I have the honor of inviting Dr. John Lin to deliver his lecture. Thank you, Dr. John Lin. Ladies and gentlemen, today my heart is full to see so many of you present in this book launch. Dear relatives, friends, architects, academicians, and students, you have come at the time when anxiety over COVID is still fashionable. <laughs> I want to thank Senior Minister of State, Sim An for launching this book today. She is also my MP for the Holland Wittima constituency. And I feel honored that she consented to grace the occasion. Thank you, Minister, for your presence. Thank you. I am also grateful to Ecomore Singapore and the URA having kindly consent to co-host this occasion and also Anthropore Publishers from Penang. Last but not least, my dear wife, who actually knows just as much as me, could even write a book in case no, I couldn't accomplish it. She knows just as much for her unfilial support, sacrifices she made throughout these 50 years of my career. Thank you, my dear wife. I wish my late parents were here to see the fruits of my labor. When I visited Penang, my time was always labored in photography and research. Also, my late brother, Lim San Ho, who introduced me to the late Tunku Abdul Rahman, who gave me considerable support in this research. Thus, I wish to dedicate this book to the memory of the late Tunku Abdul Rahman. This picture on the left, and I must learn how to use this properly, because it's might be playing up or putting it back to front. Okay, it's fine. <laughs> this picture uh, on my left, uh, on my right, uh, left or right, left, <laughs> left. <laughs> okay, on my left. Yeah. This picture on my left uh, shows Dennis Liu. Chairman of the Pam Norman chapter, seen presenting a check to the Tunku in aid of the flood victims in Aceh, Sumatra. His eldest son, wife or daughter-in-law, Datin Sri Liliana Naring says it is good that there are many decent people who remember him and his good deed, end of quote. Well, it has taken over 40 years to gather information. And I have learned that gathering information is not free. It is about relationship. It's about culture with lots of patience, endurance, and passion to use Singapore's famous word. In my years teaching history at the NUS, I realized that this subject needs to be fed with the understanding of the economic and social conditions of the country. Hence, the above timeline, which I have crafted serve this purpose. Although the book features on the period 1887 to 2017,
15 and beyond, I wish to say that um, the timeline stretches way back to the year 1786, when Francis Light founded the settlement of Penang. So given this broad perspective and depth, we begin to see, as you would in the next slide, that Francis Light and his East India Company engineers understood how climate and local technology shaped the tropical house form. Here, an example is the Balai Busa, photographed in 1870. And the Balai Busa goes back to the 1700s, still continuing in this prototype form. It is porous, it is roofs, it's about um, the verandas and cross ventilation, nothing about solidity. We never knew about solidity of form in the tropical region, right? Well, the colonials like Francis Light and engineers followed this pattern in shaping their houses. For example, the whole residence, 1810, really is a version of the Balai Busa. If you will, um, integrated with arcades. Interestingly, the carriage porch is set below the house. And if you are sharp, you could even see the staircase leading upstairs. In short, it is a Malay tradition married to an Anglo-Indian ideal. Another example is the San Suci, again 1810. Notice the Malay crafted roof and these ventilators. This is really like a kite flying in the air. But how is it that it is set into an Anglo-Indian form, which is solid? And so you have this marriage, this strange marriage between Anglo-Indian architecture and the tropical sensibility. Later on, Sen in 1880 had a, a lean-to roof. Why? To increase the shade of the carriage porch. So these are the prototypes which the vernacular architect took in mind as they mitigated new houses for the clients the new world rich, particularly from the late 19th century onwards. Next. In the early days, Asian settlers in Penang were allocated plots of land in the so-called native town, which lacked a proper infrastructure, let alone sanitation. On the other hand, Colonials grabbed large tracts of land in the so-called civil station, the suburbs, building the bungalows and villas. The above sketches show the Asian enclave built of various forms of shop houses, built with impunity to the building regulations. Penang in 1830, Penang in 1845 was almost riffraffed. The only thing that seemed permanent is the horse cart, is the ox cart, you know, bearing water, you know, for the citizens. Do you know in Singapore, at this time, they already had pipe water in the 1840s. But poor Penang, water was still driven in the ox cart. Well, ox cart in there. Okay. However, by 1850, the, Minang, the Penang municipality advertised tender drawings for the building of brick and block shop houses. It should be contiguous, contiguous in development with five footways set in empties and proper road infrastructure. Now, in this particular slide, the photograph is dated 1867. You actually can see the end block shop houses built as though they were dictated by a building program. The location, interestingly, is in the European business district. But even before then, from 1850 onwards, 
urban renewal has already begun in the Asian enclaves. But what I'm trying to say is that it is drips and drabs. Now, what happened is this. An effect of building shop houses by the Chinese carpenters ended up with what I called the shop house veneer. Look at the Edinburgh House, 1867, for the Chinese businessman, Ko Seng Tak. Can you see that the facade, which are essentially belong to the shop house, hang above the veranda without reference to the integrity of form? This, in fact, is what we call vernacular architecture, where the language or the grammar of architecture is a popuri. We now go to the next slide. However, urban development in Singapore did not come in drips and drabs. I'm proud to say, but because of the enormous prosperity as Singapore was known as the shopping emporium of the Far East, we see an organized building industry. Here, the civil station, large tracts of land owned by the colonials, and here you have Palladian houses, bungalows and palaces in short. Why is it necessary to include Singapore in the perspective of Penang? It is because it directly or indirectly impacted upon the building regulations. We shall now turn to the next picture. This painting by J.D. Thompson, 1845, reveals that Singapore, founded 33 years after Penang, was immensely organized and ahead in urban development. It was sanitized, it was organized, and certainly efficient. Moreover, it is a fact that colonial painters like J.T. Thompson and Charles Dice, in their sojourn from Singapore to Malacca to Penang, could not produce similar impressions in Penang. Thus, only in Singapore do we, be, do we begin to see prosperity, uh, a wonderful development uh, of shop houses set in organized streets and so forth. Now, what can I say about this? There are three observations. Number one, the building site of shop houses which stretch from Tulok Ayer Bay to Newbridge Street is so massive that it is not impossible to expect that this became an open-air studio for the incumbent vernacular mm -hmm. architect to learn his trade. It was learning architecture by rote, learning to read tender drawings from Fort Canning, learning to apply building regulations, learning to produce standardized building components, and so forth. Point number two. This is the prototype Singapore shop house, which I coined the shop house Reflexia. It was then exported out by itinerant civil engineers for urban development in the port cities of Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, and of course, the Malayan Peninsula, including Penang. Indeed, the building program that we see here, in my view, is a precedent of the HDB of modern Singapore. In fact, Professor Wong Yun Chi said to me, in fact, this is the true indigenous architecture of urban Singapore. Why have we not declared so, even to UNESCO? <laughs> Point three, we find places like Hong Kong Street and Carpenter Street. Can you see Hong Kong Street here? Can you see Hong Kong uh, Carpenter Street here? Now, 
let me unlock some mystery. I believe that this was the place where the Chinese carpenters reside and may have attracted prospective businessmen to invest in them. How? To produce prefabricated timber cottages for overseas export. Evidently, Singapore had sent prefabricated cottages to Australia during the gold rush days and roughly between 1,000 to 2,000 cottages were received by local agents in Melbourne, such as Chun Xiang and Chun Book and Company. These are the actual spelling that we received. It is therefore clear that if carpenters of shop houses can produce timber cottages for Australia, then they can produce bungalows for local consumption in Singapore. And likewise, the tradition persists in Penang. The first evidence of the Singapore cottage in Melbourne is the reference by Captain King in 1837. An example of this cottage was named the Singapore Cottage, this one here. It was actually named the Singapore Cottage, later renamed the Argyle Cottage at number one Lonsdale Street. My wife and I visited this cottage and the truth is you can see Chinese inscriptions on the roof members. How wonderful! Singapore's export to Australia and now Australia is applying for UNESCO recognition. <laughs> wonderful! We are very generous. <laughs> Interestingly, in Geelong, the esplanade facing Kurayo Bay was named the Singapore Terrace. To, in, to add insult to injury. <laughs> Let's proceed to the next one. Here you are, the Singapore cottage. Well, in terms of hypothesis, the progress of the Malaysian architect must be accompanied by the timeline. We are here today in the year 2022, 20, uh, 20, uh, in the so-called fourth wave of architects. If you look back, I've organized a timeline based on 30-year cycle. If you go back, the second wave of architects is from 1987 to 2017, way back 30 years, 1957 to 87, way back again, 1927 to 1957. And then we have in here what I call consolidating the architectural profession the year from 1927 to 1887. And then the mysterious dark years in part one, the Penang milieu, fumbling forward in Penang. But Singapore local bylaws set up by Raffles and Fakwa was already blazing. New directions and prototypes by the amended Indian bylaws and um, the clause which says compliance to setbacks and so on and so forth. So we have this timeline essentially to guide the analysis of the Penang House or even the Singapore House for that purpose. In the next slide, the purpose of the genealogy with the timeline is an essential companion. Why? Because we need to find how the architects that we dealt with relate to one another. Note that Lin Su Lun and Chu Ying Yang and their sons, Lim Yong Fong and Chu Kok King, actually evolved from the architectural firm of Wilson and New Brunner. And Wilson and New Brunner actually evolved from Swan and McLaren of Singapore. So we begin to see vernacular architects linked to the colonials. Likewise, at the top of the chart, we begin to see the current architects in Penang mentioned in this book. And some of them are linked back to Ang King Ling, E. J. Xiao, Buti and Edwards, and others, all based in Singapore. We shall see that the next slide focuses on these two gentlemen, Lim Sulun, 1889, 
His son, born 1917. Chu Eng Yam, born 1894. His son, Chu Kok Keng, born 1922. Now, these are their um, credentials, so to speak. And I will introduce them later. But just to set the base that the book is actually focused on the development of these two pairs of father and son architects. Let's go to the next. So we go back to the Penang milieu, the dark years, the confusing time where data was most frustrating to get. But we had to get, we had to dream about this. And I spent 40 years dreaming about this. So here we are today, fumbling forward. What happened in 1817? Local bylaws in Penang about fire pre uh, prevention, you know, um, the lack of infrastructure. Then 1822, Singapore, local bylaws by Raffles and Farquhar. Then what happened in the next period? We see uh, the amended Indian Acts and the rise of the technical assistance uh, under the Indian Act of 8 or 14 and the compliance of building specifications and setbacks. So these were the very um, muddy years for research and, and we, we need more um, um, strength, more uh, passion to, to, to look into that. In the next timeline, is more interesting. Can we proceed to the next timeline? In this blue arrow, the part two, we find the architects consolidating their practice between the years of 1887 and 1957. These were the periods where we could obtain data and begin to um, explore the implications of bylaws, um, and municipal ordinances, um, and the tension of the practice together. Um, so I didn't want to bore you so much, but I'd like to now talk about this period here and what happened in Singapore and Penang in the next slide. Well, Singapore rose as a regional headquarters in the building industry by the arrival of leading engineers, architects, and artisans. Singapore became the metropolis even for the Malayan archipelago. We see from Bangkok, Cavalieri Rudolfo Nolli, the um, architectural stone specialist. We see Steen Sehested of Swanson and Sehested, reinforced concrete specialist building multi story buildings at Coil Key. We see Emil Brise from Brosat and Mopin from Saigon specializing in concrete shell construction, constructing the magnificent central market in Kuala Lumpur. It was meant to be double story, but right now they still use the building as one story. I don't know why. They could add another story if they want to. Well, these are the specialists. We have uh, HR Benz from Zurich. We have um, Everson from Copenhagen. We have uh, William Sawfield, the furniture designer from Bath, London. And all these specialists converge in Singapore. Penang, however, have one interesting contribution. pre Furniture Company had 70 Chinese craftsmen designing Jacobian and Chippendale style furnitures. And this is very important because they become part of furnishing the Penang House. The firm of Stark and McNeil is also very important because they are the equivalent of the Swan and McLaren in Penang. And uh, rather than introducing all these gentlemen here, I'd like to focus on one architect. And he is here, right here, the, at Pips Creek. Charles G. Boucher. Why he is so important to Stark and McNeil is this. He was an architect in the PWD Alosta, and he built the residency 
for the British councillor. And that particular style was Villa Imo, the central block with side wings and towers. When he joined Stark and McNeil in Penang, he as well introduced uh, this design as a prototype, designing the homestead for Yap Chaw Yi. Now, this homestead became the mother of all villas in Penang. As you may well know, the pediment and portico style, the Italianate towers on the side, the bow fronted portico and colonnade, this became the blueprint for the vernacular architecture of Penang. That's why Baucha is important. Baucha is also important for his modernist contribution because it was his modern interpretation of reinforced concrete forms and cantilevers that local architects like Chu Ying Yam and Su Lun imitated. We shall now move to the next slide. Let's look at um, Mr. Chu Ying Yam. The story goes that when New Brunner stopped his practice in 1917, a member of his staff, Chu Ying Yam, took over the office and the building plans. And what did he do? He submitted this building plan for Chung Lai Hock, 1918, under his own name. What a clever idea. A vernacular architect with no proper training, able to design, build, a castle mansion, striking the age to fashionable Penang for even more jobs and credibility. Wow, he was quite a man. Interestingly, in the next slide, he began to design fashionable villas. This one here is known as the Great Wall. Many of you who traveled to Penang Hill would have witnessed this unusual pile on the left side of the funicular rail. Here, the architecture of Norman Shaw with its gables and attics, with its uh, multi-directional facades must have been wonderful uh, to be captured. If we enter the house, go to the attic level and look down, this is what we find in the next slide. Here, you can see the funicular railway tr train going up the hill. I remember as a kid in 1948, peering up at this great wall, because it was a great wall, and this villa stood on top of it. How magnificent. Up here, you can view Georgetown, you can view Butterworth, and Bukit Makajum, just some 20 miles away. Wouldn't you like to live here? Bracing fresh mountain air. Cool climate for health. Growing flowers, carnations, dahlias and so on. And vegetables. This is the only hill station east of India. Penang has it. Sorry, we don't have that. But we have other things. Now, the next slide. Chu Ying Yang designed 39 units of townhouses they are duplex houses for the patriarch Chia Leong Kia. The spirit of family togetherness is expressed by the semi-D townhouse typology. It, to me, is the dichotomy between a shop house and bungalow. Why? Because he wanted his families to live close together. <coughs> Today, this tradition still holds. Only those related to the Chia family are allowed to live here. Not to sell, neither rent out their properties. In the next slide, my wife and I went from door to door searching for the Chia Leong Kia's relatives. Finally, it was through the website that we got into contact with Chia Leong Kia's great granddaughter, Chia Mei Lin who is now seen gestulating at the photograph of her great-grandfather. Wow, the interior is delightful, don't you? It is airy, 
It is well ventilated. Uh, the Tudor light in green and faulted glass. The uh, Dutch style double partitioned uh, casement windows. Uh, the shop house like structures on top. Uh, and this general uh, symmetry of the living room. The altar, which you cannot see, is right in the axis where the Goddess of Mercy is situated, encapsulates that interior of the Penang house. It feels almost like an Ang Lao. And this is the dichotomy I'm saying, because Chia Leong Kia wanted to build Ang Laos for his descendants, but you can't have Ang Laos all over Bangkok Lane. The semi D seemed to be the version, and a successful one too. Well, upstairs, you could see the relationship of a modern kampung spirit at work. Because I believe that the relatives of Chia Leong Kia were able to gossip across to each other. How nice! <laughs> Unfortunately, our HDB houses are too large for such um, intimacy. But I think this is very nice, a very nice idea. It must have worked terribly well in the pre-war years. Now, Chu Ying Yam's approach to modernity was cautious, if not a bit confused, during the 1930s. Here, the villa for Tan Chin Guan, dated 1936, is intuitively modern. Why? Because the influence of Boucher is here. The, um, the string courses that is decisively horizontal, and the general uh, demeanor of, uh, of, of a horizontal flight. But he is muddled up with traditions. Why? Because of cultural and social reckoning. Look at this. The layout of these windows are almost 100 years old. The Penang Club building, 1868, shows the dispersion of windows here. Two windows here, followed by one towards the side shoulders, repeated. And here, three windows up there. Here there are three windows, because it formed part of the portico of the four columns of the classical tradition, or chatter style. Then he has the barrel vault above here. That comes from the mansion at number um, thir 12, 32 at Northam Road, designed by J.C. Miller. Then look at the parapet, the finale, comes probably from the E and O Hotel, 1922 there. So you see, I mean, clients have their ways, modern but not too modern. It must be a bit of touch of this and a bit of touch of that, not too different. To today, our condominium owners say, chandelier, very necessary. Um, waterfall, very necessary. <laughs> but when you enter, what do you find? The maid ironing over the dining table, the young children having tutorial at one side. So it, architecture is almost a theater, don't you? Uh, it is a series of collectibles, of imageries. Clearly, the Penang house resounds a unique hybrid quality, which frolics between tradition and modernity. In those days, radio hams required an installation of the radio room for the houses to receive transmission from the BBC London for news of the war in Europe. Well, Chu Ying um, then produced what he called the Radio House. Between 1938 and 40, the result is a severe pile looking like a battleship rendered in grey Shanghai plaster. Uh, the age recalls the Kalang Airport, suggesting <laughs> modernity, and even steep in an art deco trimmings here and there. All very modern, but the radio house was at top, receiving news from BBC London. Wow. 
But of course, the passion went so steep that in the next slide, we will see that members of the deceased wantonly, perhaps forlornly, say, I wish to carry my radio house along with me. <laughs> the radio house, in this case, is concealed behind the, the second story attic, okay, behind this balcony in there. But of course, you must forgive those Chinese craftsmen of tinsel and paper. They couldn't detail it quite well. <laughs> but really, the send-off must have been terrific, especially when it burns. <laughs> Here, we see technology venerated. We shall now turn our subject to Lim Su Lun. He was a colleague of Chu Ying Yang, who both worked as tracers in the office of New Brona. I love to talk about the New Brona family from Malacca, you know, but time doesn't prevent me to do so. But what is important is you could read in Lim Su Lun's work the progression from, of architecture from the eclectic to the modern transitional or things like that. Now, what happened was when New Brona retired in 1917, remember I told you that Chu Ying Yang was the one who got all the building plans and became the toast of the town with his castle mansions and society accolades. Well, Lim Su Lun was perhaps not so connected. Why? He actually was a sin cake. He arrived in Singapore, studied in St. Joseph Institution. His teacher, brother James, was impressed by his artistic talents and introduced him to work as a tracer in the land office. Lim later went across to Kuala Lumpur and worked for Brigadier General A.B. Herbeck in the studio of the Public Works Department. Then he worked with Chan and Company, who architects, before venturing to Penang to set up his practice. Now, his works are essentially eclectic in those early days. This bungalow for Chung Lai Hin, 1917, marks the year he left the service of New Brona. If you would find that it is uh, anything but nonsensical, I do not say this unkindly, but it is so bizarre as to capture every Peranakan Chinese woman comparing the designs of the detail with the sarong and kabaya and so on and so forth. <laughs> but look at the vernacular side of it. Here is a bungalow, or is it a villa? I don't know. I'm confused. But let's say that it is a bungalow. At the carriage porch, there are three arches, which means four columns in the classical tetra style. Upstairs in the sitting veranda, two arches. Then on top of it is the pediment, detailed exactly from New Brunner studio. This is a mismatch. It is um, confusion, it's contradiction. Uh, it is everything in the potpourri. This is, if you like, the straight eclectic. Um, I wouldn't call it a style because there are no definitive about this. Well, that was 1917. Now look, 10 years later, Sulun designed a custom mansion for Tan Kui Lao in the golden age of Penang's architecture. Where are all the frolic is now subdued. Uh, the elements are now rectilinear. They are, they are um, uh, um, disciplined. Uh, they are precise almost modernist. Let's go to the next example. If you go back to the year 1917, his eclecticism was raging on. This is a semi-detached house uh, for Ong Bin Wan. This design suggests a social symbol of an Anglo-Indian country club. In fact, 
It is a semi-detached bungalow, a semi-detached house. Um, the social symbols are suggested by the Tudor-style rosettes, the half-timber English details here, and even the cupola are clad with zinc sheets in a gay manner. In my view, he was testing the market to see which of his design is more gay and therefore more work. And it was fashionable in those times. Why not? In the next slide, 1926, Lim Su Lun had become more restrained. His architecture more gentle, more precise, the detail more refined. This villa for Lim Bun Oh, 1926, it reveals the typical cartouche and the palm leaf feathers, a trademark of Lim Su Lun. You will find this trademark inscribed in the row of shop houses in Penang, such as Kimberley Street, the corner of Northern Street and Brick Kiln Road, known as Gudwara Jalan. The point is, Chu Ying Yang, by 1926 or 10 years later, has become a very competent designer. How competent was he? Let's turn to the next slide. This is Hia Hall, 1928, my uncle's residence. If you look at this piece of work, it is not so much a confectionery. It is more of a masterpiece, Palladian bungalow narrative. The three parts, the pediment and portico, is now interpreted in the front by the three windows, the central arch, the two corner towers, highlighted by the gable roofs, articulating a very clear body of parts. The elements are clear. Uh, they may be bizarre, but they are eye-catching. And I'm sure it's a landmark in those days. It portrays solidity. In the next slide, Lim Su Lun's most amazing achievement of the uh, modern transitional is his new studio and house at Dunlop Street, 1928. Here, the form is modernist and severe. It features a cantilevered upper floor a, made of reinforced concrete. And the entire form is um, well controlled. The leavening created by the arch, a fan light in the center here, and over the entrance over there is only very discreet. But you could read a precise horizontality about this. So we could say that Sulun is becoming more and more modern. Even by the next slide, the villa for Chia Sing Ki, 1935. It's stunning because of its rigidity due to the use of reinforced concrete. We may not agree with it, but you could see his forms of reinforced concrete begin to reveal the light and shade, so well liked by the colonials. And what is interesting is the cupola on top, which is concrete. Uh, and uh, so this is a kind of uh, modernity which has blazed the trail uh, during the late 1930s. Now, after the war, Chu Ying Yam and his son Chu Kok King ventured into a series of townhouses, or should be called terrace houses. It was a solution for the housing shortage and the post-war baby boom. Uh, these became the solution of a rising middle-income society. These modern terraces 
in Penang are everywhere. I remember as a child looking at these huge trains of terrace houses. I didn't understand them. They look bleak and lifeless. But really, they are not bleak and lifeless because now we begin to appreciate the art deco modernity, um, the, the detail of the porch wall, um, the um, inlaid doors and windows, uh, the corner semicircular balconies. Um, this filled the landscape of post war Penang. Well, in the post war years, Lim Soo Loon tr had a very different outlook. He did, his architecture reflected a diversity of style and experiments. This is a house for No Bint Ali, No Naha Bint Ali, 1947. Lim Soo Lun reveals his ingenuity to redefining a Malay house tradition set in an urban context. You can find that it is the main house here with a, a surambi, the kitchen that actually faces the front not the back of the house. And I believe that it is a way of saying that, hey, with post-war years, you need to have uh, the access to the front. Maybe you could sell your goreng pisang in front, <laughs> straight from the kitchen. How very clever. You don't need you know, a, a car to do so. The form essentially are Anglo-Indian, uh, but I think it's a very clever reinterpretation of a Malay house. Well, Lim Soo Lun and his son experiment with a variety of design approaches. In this case, they inducted a gropius influence by producing an asymmetrical form here, punctuated by round windows, the treatment of uh, rectangular windows, corner detailing here, uh, the abutment of the um, verandas, the open balconies, um, they were very, very daring in the year 1953. Um, another would be a house for Dr. Lim Sukui, 1955. Um, here, the front elevation is defined by a ranch-like form an extended hip roof, the plan being linear, a complete changeover of the pre-war bungalow house. Uh, the space are completely different. The bedrooms are clustered uh, differently. The kitchen and the dining became one that is no portico. It is modernity. It is outright daring. In the next picture, we will see the house for Cheng Han Leong, 1959. You could see the gropius influence here. The corner windows, the round um, potholes in here, um, and as though he sought artistic license, the box window being curved, um, almost like a joke. But it's modern in the sense that um, it copied the Chinese swimming club designed by Everson at, uh, in those days. A and I believe that it was this kind of concrete boxes that shocked Penang, who was then still conservative. Now, we move to part two. The second wave of architects, 1957 to 1987, saw a series of uh, progression on the registration of architects here. What happened is this, in the profession, the uh, architect's ordinance of 1926 allowed the vernacular architect to be registered upon practical experience. And both Chu Ying Yam and Su Lun could display record of their work. And they were registered as architect in the same ranking as a colonial architect with an ARDA accreditation. That's very clear. What happened then is that in 19, 
41 is another architect's ordinance. This time it came from Malaya and they re registered them as architects as well. However, by the second wave of architects in 1967, it was a period of nationalism. The architects included those trained from overseas. I'm sure they must have discussed in the council. We can't have those pre-war architects um, enjoy such standing. But apparently, Chu Eng Yam and Su Lun were recognized as architects, but their sons were not. What happened is this, in 1951, the, the sons of Chu Eng Yam and Su Lun were registered under a special provision called specially authorized person. Can you imagine in those days, you have a registered architect, Lim Su Lun, or a colonial architect like Bao Zhe. Standing next to him is a vernacular architect of recent uh, genre, and he is registered under the provision of specially authorized person. So this created confusion. This is a registered architect. This is a specialized authorized person. Who is the true architect? It is such a conundrum that the um, Board of Architects in 1967 began to differentiate the categories. Number one, the registered architect. Number two, the registered building draftsman. Number three, interior design consultant. Which means the sons of Lim Su Lun and Chu Ying Yam were registered as a building draftsman. They no longer enjoyed the privilege of being called specially authorized person. It was a kind of uh, unhappiness that um, dragged on, not until 1996, when all these things were done away with, and no longer a draftsman could practice as an architect. We now look into this class of 1966 graduates of Building Design Technical College, Kuala Lumpur. The above students of a diploma course attending the Technical College in KL were subsequently given an opportunity for studies in the Commonwealth to upgrade their degree into a B.Arch. The person responsible for this arrangement was Professor Brian Lewis, head of the School of Architecture of the Melbourne University, who happened to be appointed an external examiner of the Technical College. So what happened was there was uh, this axis between uh, graduates of the Technical College in KL and the School of Architecture in Melbourne University. In this sense, we may infer that the University of Melbourne topped the list of the Commonwealth universities, which produced more than 1,000 architects for Singapore and Malaysia. And to prove the point, I wish to quote some lead Singaporean architects huh? whose name extracted from a plaque registered as donors to the new School of Architecture that was inaugurated in 2015. And the names you will recognize among them are Alan Cho, Ko Xiao Chuan, Lim Wen Jin, Tan Ka Ho, Wong Sui Yin, Alfred Wong, Yang Su Suan, Edwin Chu, and many more. And if I go to the Malaysia side, you will find the same group of architects, Kinton Lo, uh, and so on and so forth. We will now proceed to the second wave of architects, 1957 to 1987. These represents the new generation of the overseas trained architects. For example, Johnny Hias designed his own house at Biggs Road, now owned by Dick Young. Derek David's own house at the South 
beach of Penang known as Getak Sango and a modern kampung house for Askanda and Tunku Idora at Telok Kumba. In the next slides, we find architects whose design appears even more striking. Hmm? Here, houses with flat roofs appear to be the cutting edge of the time. Lim Chong Kiet hmm, produced houses for Dr. Arya, followed by townhouses at Arutun Road. Another is architect Eddie Yung, who designed a house for Lim Kian Siu in the center in here. Flat roofed, very untropical, but it was the fashion to be daring, eye-catching, and onward, the spectacular, Dennis Liu, top right, hmm, who engaged a pitch roof hidden behind a spaceship, the parapet known as the parapet house known as Margaret View, now known as the Sutira House. Then architect Tan Chong Kiet hmm, produced an indigenous Javanese house, the jump the Pendopus roof form at Hillside. Another from Melbourne University graduate is Ng King Sim, whose house being more conventional, seemed to be influenced by Everson. The timeline now shifts to the third wave of architects, 1987 to 2017. This is perhaps the most um, memorial period because Penang began effort at conservation. And many of you may have attended the conservation conference that was um, organized by the state government at that time. And um, at that time, we will look at the architects who produced interesting houses. They seem philosophical and occasionally mingle by an expression of structuralism in the next slide. Here, Lawrence Lowe leads the way, such as the Arcadia Condominium on the right-hand side. The Arcadia Condominium actually replicates the colonial bungalows, the use of rustic material, and broad roofs and eaves. Another is the urban sanctuary on the left which combines themes from the Chinese shop house and Malayan architecture. At the same time, Lawrence Lowe produced two houses at Punchap Bukit Mutiara, this is spectacular. No doubt, this is daring, if you dare to live there at all. <laughs> but it made a point. Hmm? Along these lines, is our Melbourne, our NUS graduate, Chan Boon Hee, who produced what he called the Flying Roof House, ostensibly overlooking a sheer rock outcrop at Taman Jasutan. And here, Anthony Chan, also NUS graduate, produced a Balinese-inspired house, which sits precariously over the concrete stilts and framework. In the last slide, we will see that the year 1917 seemed particularly prominent because of this particular house here, which was called the Ramp House by a Kuching architect, Ri He Min. Here, the built form seemed conceptualized in conjunction with a series of ramps and semi-open spaces, something not seen before. Well, you need to be a bit patient because technology is lagging me, <laughs> but we will arrive quite soon. Okay, there we are, the next one. 
And then back to the Malay sentiment on top there. These are a series of estate houses produced by Atsa architects from Kuala Lumpur and supervised by Ai Tariao in Penang, Farid Kamal and Ng Beng Chiang designed their own house as well, here and there, which are refined. Last but not least, John Eastful, his postmodernist house. It features a Baroque dome placed inside the roof, which seemed to reflect the past glory of Penang. In conclusion, I'd like to recall back to you that this timeline was created through more than 40 years of studies and research. I hope that it will be a great help to guide scholars, researchers and authors pursue further study. I leave you this my legacy to all posterity in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you.